So I'm very excited because uh, it's been a long time since we've been able to do communion together. Uh, and we're going to be able to do that as a church here shortly. So I'm looking forward to that. Let me pray for us. Father, we give you thanks for the good fruit that your Holy Spirit bears in us. We give you thanks for the way that you work in our hearts to produce these things that bring you glory and honor. We give you thanks that you are actively at work in us and through us, shaping us into the image of Christ, that we might walk as he walked and do the same kinds of works of righteousness that he did. And Lord, I pray that you would by the teaching of your word, conform us even more into his image. In Christ's name, amen. Open in your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 7. We are nearing the end of our teaching through the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Believe it or not, we jumped into this when the whole coronavirus thing shut church down. So it's cool that as we come to an end, we're able to get back together in some fashion But this morning, I want to deal with a real basic concept. I want to try and answer the question, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? And as basic as that may sound, in my years of ministry experience, I've come to realize that there's actually a lot of confusion about that question, what is a Christian? As mainstream as Christianity is, I think very few people have a thorough understanding of what it means to be a Christian. I mean, think about this in your head. If I asked you the question, what is a Christian, what would you say? How would you answer that? Maybe you would say a Christian is somebody who has placed their faith in Jesus. Maybe you would say a Christian is somebody who goes to church on Sunday. Or a Christian is someone who's asked Jesus into their heart. Or a Christian is somebody who gets to go to heaven when they die. Now there is an element of truth to each of those answers for sure, but I don't think that those answers are sufficient to describe what a Christian is. And actually, Jesus has been answering this question, what is a Christian, all through the Sermon on the Mount. And as he gets to his close, he's going to help us really fill out that definition. And so as we look at Scripture together in the closing words of Jesus, both today and in the next two weeks, we are hopefully going to get a very clear picture of what a Christian actually is. So let's dive into this together. We're going to read Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Okay, remember back to last week, Jesus gave his listeners this command. The command was, enter by the narrow gate. Choose the difficult path. And now he's letting his listeners know, that's you and I, that along the way, as you walk this path, there are going to be imposters. And Jesus is a good teacher. He's he's such a caring leader. He loves us so deeply. He wants us to be well aware and well equipped to meet whatever challenges might face us on this journey as we follow him. And one of those challenges is imposters who may look good outwardly but inwardly are ravenous wolves with an appetite for destruction and chaos. Now, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, this verse, judging others, Jesus doesn't want us to be judgmental. He doesn't want us to be arrogant. He doesn't want us to be proud. He doesn't want us to be haughty in our relationships with others. But he does want us to beware. That's the first word in verse 15, beware. 
He wants us to be discerning, to be wise and know the difference between good and evil and false and true, to know the difference between a fellow sheep and a bloodthirsty wolf who's out to devour sheep. And so Jesus is going to give us a very simple test by which we can discern and judge rightly a real Christian from an imposter. Now, before we get to the answer of this question, what is a Christian? I want to say Jesus begins this by saying, beware of false prophets. But I I want to claim, I want to submit to you that Jesus is giving us a tool that goes beyond prophets. And here's why. I think this is a test by which we can generally evaluate which kingdom people belong to. Do they belong to the kingdom of man or the kingdom of God? I remember one time I was pressing somebody with this verse, uh, somebody who claimed to be a Christian, and I was having a hard time believing their claim because I, I didn't see evidence of their claim. And they replied, you know, this verse doesn't apply to me, Grady, because I'm not a prophet. These words have nothing to do with me. But is that true? Is Jesus only talking about prophets here? Flip with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. I think it's important for me to establish this if I'm going to persuade you that God has given you tools by which you can evaluate the claims of other people when they say they love Jesus. Acts chapter 2. We're going to read a couple verses here, and I want you to understand what's going on as we flip here and look at these verses. After Jesus rose from the dead, he spent 40 days with his disciples, and then he ascended back into heaven to be with God the Father, and he taught them all the way up until his ascension that even though he was going to go, he would not leave them alone. He would send a helper, a teacher, the Spirit of God. He would leave them the Holy Spirit, which would come upon them in power and equip them not only to know what he had taught, but to actually do it. So 10 days then after Jesus disappears back into the heavens to reign with all authority at the right hand of God the Father, 10 days later, the Jews are celebrating a feast in Jerusalem called Pentecost. And while the disciples are gathered celebrating together with the Jews, the Holy Spirit of God falls upon these Christians, these believers. And it falls upon them with a mighty wind and a flame of fire. And as that happens, the Apostle Peter stands up and he begins to preach this wonderful sermon. And he tells everybody, what you are witnessing is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about a new covenant that will come because of the work of the Messiah. Now read with me Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 16. Peter says, But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Peter says, when the prophet Joel prophesied that, he was talking about right now. That's what Peter claims. Now, did you catch the connection that Peter makes here? Peter is quoting this Old Testament prophet Joel. And what the prophecy states is there's a sense in which everyone who has the Spirit of God inside of them is like a prophet. In the Old Testament, a prophet was somebody who was specially anointed by God, filled with the Spirit of God, to do the will of God. It was an exclusive role in the Old Testament. The filling of the Spirit of God inside of people was an abnormal thing. 
to have this anointing of God's Spirit. But now, now that Jesus has gone to be with God the Father, seated on his throne in heaven, he has given to each and every one of us who trust in his name the filling of his Holy Spirit. Power by the Spirit of God to do the will of God. We all, through faith in Christ, have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. These are the last days in which God has poured out his flesh, or his Spirit on all flesh. Meaning that it is now no longer exclusively priests or Jews or prophets that can know and do the will of God. But every person is invited to enter into the kingdom of God, receive the spirit of God, and walk in obedience to God. Now don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that every Christian has the gift of prophecy. I don't think that's what this text is saying. I'm saying every Christian has the indwelling Spirit of God. And that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, teaches us the wisdom of God and empowers us to do the will of God. Okay, so now, back to Matthew 7. If you'll flip back there. The tool for evaluation that Jesus gives us here can be applied to every person then who claims to be a Christian. We discern in one another the fruit of the Spirit of God's indwelling presence. It's a simple principle. Only people empowered by the Spirit of Jesus can do the works of Jesus. Or look at it another way. Jesus has been teaching all throughout this Sermon on the Mount about what life in the kingdom of God looks like. And now he tells them the only way that you can live this kind of life is through the Spirit of God. The only way that you can bear this fruit is through God's presence in you. Or another way of saying it, you can only do the work of God through the Spirit of God. So by this teaching here in Matthew 7, we can say a Christian is someone who bears the good fruit of the teaching of Jesus through the Spirit of Jesus alive within them. I said that fast. Let me say it again. Pay close attention. A Christian is someone who bears the good fruit of the teaching of Jesus through the power of the Spirit of Jesus alive within them. It is not enough to say that a Christian is somebody who says they have faith in Jesus because genuine faith in Jesus fills you to the brim with the Spirit of God and leads you to walk in the will of God, bearing the fruit of Jesus. Now, often people will say, you know, the gospel is best summarized in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Maybe you know these verses. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. That's a great verse. It tells us that God saves us by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that work is entirely an act of God. But I wonder why People often quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and then stop there. Because the following verse says a lot. It fills out the definition of the gospel by telling us, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the saving grace that we've been given through faith in Jesus Christ leads us to walk in the good works that Jesus himself did. And so a Christian is someone who walks in good works because grace has saved them. A Christian is someone who bears the good fruit of the Holy Spirit of God because they have faith in Jesus and because they abide in Christ. Now, you may want me to explain what good works are. I don't know, maybe you're new to this whole thing and you're like, explain what that is. What is good fruit? And I'll do that, but guys, seriously, isn't good fruit just evident? 
Isn't it obvious? I mean, people can inherently tell the difference between good things and bad things. That's why we have a tendency to hide so much of ourselves from other people. It's crazy to pretend like we don't know what good things are and bad things are. We know. But just in case you are confused, the Bible lays it out very clearly for us. It tells us what the good fruit of the Holy Spirit is. Chrissy read it for us from Galatians chapter 5. First, the bad fruit, it includes things like sexual immorality, sensuality, idolatry, enmity, strife, divisions, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, envy, drunkenness. That's not an exhaustive list, but as you hear those words, you probably inherently feel in your soul like, yes, I know that those are bad things. Or maybe you know because you feel a little bit of shame because you engage in them from time to time. That is bad fruit. And if it's not obvious to you that that's bad fruit, then your heart is very callous. Your heart is very hard. And sadly, There's a lot of this stuff in churches. Enmity, strife, jealousy, rivalry, divisions. And that bad fruit is contrasted with good fruit, which includes things like joy, peace, patience, kindness. That one stands out to me. The Spirit of God is kind. Goodness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, think about those words for a second. Let them sink in. Those things sound a lot like what Jesus has been teaching through the Sermon on the Mount. Don't they? They're human actions that come from a good heart that reflects the goodness of God himself. And what Jesus is saying is that since good things are obviously good and bad things are obviously bad, the people of God who reflect God and have his spirit inside of them should be obviously good. A Christian should grow to be obviously good. A healthy tree bears good fruit. Now friends, as much as I want to give grace and mercy to people and be patient because that's a fruit of the Spirit, because I need grace and I need mercy and I need you to be patient with me. But we cannot deny the fact that Jesus says in these verses, Christians should be obviously good. Because they produce the good fruit of God himself. And if you claim to be a Christian, nobody should doubt that. Nobody should doubt it. Not because you never sin, but because your life is so obviously empowered by the Holy Spirit that it is impossible to deny. If you're a Christian, you should be living a kingdom quality of life in the way that you are gentle and patient and kind and generous and selfless. Not because of you, but because of all that has been given to you through Christ. You should be living that kind of life not only because you are putting your whole entire effort into it, you should do that, but also because that is simply the kind of life that the Holy Spirit lives out in the people of God as they pursue Jesus. If you abide in Jesus and his teaching, then he will bear much fruit in your life. And so a Christian is a person who lives a Christ-like quality of life, not by their power, but because the power of God is at work within them. A Christian produces the fruit of goodness because God is making that happen in them. 
So I want to give you a few more tools to kind of fill out what this looks like, okay? I'm going to plug it in nicely for you into the four C's, right? This is like old school Baptist preacher style. I got four C's for you. And if you're the note-taking type, this is your moment to shine. Um, This is not an, an area of particular excellence for me in preaching, so we'll see how this goes. Number one, good fruit is conspicuous. Good fruit is conspicuous. That's a big word, but I needed four C's, so we're stuck with it, okay? Good fruit is conspicuous. It just means it's obvious. Good fruit is obvious. Friends, if you have to dig real deep and look real close and use a magnifying glass and throw out 98% of the evidence to find a couple pieces of good fruit in someone's life, you are not looking at a Christian. Do not be deceived. Jesus makes it very clear. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Paul says essentially the same thing in one of his letters to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 24 through 25. The Holy Spirit writes, The sins of some people are conspicuous. There's my C word. They're obvious. They go before them to judgment. But the sins of others appear later, less conspicuous. But so also good works are conspicuous. They're obvious. And even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Now, like Peter says, Paul sometimes has some things that are tough to understand. That's a verse you may need to ponder a bit, but basically it says, you can't keep evil deeds hidden forever, and you can't keep a good heart hidden forever either. Good deeds show themselves. Or to say it another way, the kind of person that you are eventually becomes obvious. It may not be obvious to you, but ask other people close to you, behind closed doors to tell you, to tell them the real truth about you, it's obvious. Because the fruit which a tree bears is obvious. Now, it does take time for fruit to mature. So if you're a new Christian, it's going to take some time for you to learn the way of Jesus. And so let's show the fruit of patience with one another through this process. But can I just be brutally honest here? Sometimes because we don't want to be unloving, and I'm going to put that in quotes, unloving, we flat out deny what Jesus says here in Matthew 7, at least in practice. We see a person and they claim to be a Christian, and because we don't want to be unloving, We just let them bear bad fruit over and over and over and over again. And we go on accepting their claim that they are a Christian and a follower of Jesus when there is very little evidence to support that. Jesus says a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And he tells us to beware of these people for that very reason. Good fruit is conspicuous, it's obvious. Second, good fruit is consistent. Look, we all waver, we all mess up, we are human. Even as Christians, we remain sinners. But good fruit is consistent. Brand new Christians in particular, again, you're just learning to walk this way, this new spirit-filled life. But if the Holy Spirit is really alive within us, then it's going to produce generally good consistent, righteous fruit. Maybe you remember the scene in Galatians when Paul says that he, he met up with Peter and Peter was living this like double life between the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul's problem with what Peter was doing was that it was inconsistent. Peter was behaving one way with one group of people and another way with another group of people. And that's not how the Holy Spirit works. The good fruit of Jesus is the same whether we are at home or at work, whether we're at church or behind the closed door of our room. It's the same behavior towards strangers and those that we love the most. 
Because God himself is unchanging and his nature is bound to what is good and right and true, the people who belong to him will bear generally consistent good fruit. They will be the same godly person Monday through Saturday as they are on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And Jesus tells us because good trees bear good fruit, we should expect to observe a life of consistently good things in those who are filled with his Spirit. Third, good fruit is copious. It's copious. Again, I needed C's, so you get weird words. All copious means is plentiful. It's plentiful. This good fruit that the Spirit bears in us is plentiful. It spills out of Christians because it is the relentless overflow of God's goodness poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John tells us in John 3, you know that Jesus appeared to take away sins and in him there is no sin. Anyone, or sorry, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Those verses have created a lot of distress in Christians throughout the millennia. And maybe they should. But I think what John is driving towards is that good fruit is copious. It's plentiful. John is not telling Christians that they don't sin, that they only do good and righteous things. Some people have looked at that and gone, Christians should be perfect. That's not what he means. What he's telling us is that in the life of a Christian, it is sin that is out of the ordinary. Christians practice righteousness. In other words, he's telling us that Christians are people who do good and righteous works as their general way of life. Their good fruit is copious and plentiful because Jesus came to take away sin. Now think about that. You may have just heard me say, Jesus came to take away the condemnation of sin. But that's not what I said and that's not what John says. Jesus actually came to remove the actions of sin from us as we walk in his teaching. And sometimes I think we do settle for this way of thinking that's deeply offensive to the Holy Spirit. That Jesus came to take away our condemnation, but he just left us to go on sinning. That's not what John says. That's not what Scripture teaches. The Bible says that by God's grace and through the Spirit's power, we can conquer sin and we can produce plentiful good fruit for the glory of Jesus. Jesus came to take away sin. Fourth and lastly, good fruit is continuous. It's continuous. In Luke 8.14, Jesus teaches that Good fruit will grow to maturity in the life of a believer. And he tells us nothing can snatch his sheep from his hands. And Paul says nothing can separate us from the love of God. This means that not only will good fruit in our lives be obvious, conspicuous, plentiful, copious, and consistent, but it will endure until the very end. It will be continuous. If we press on to follow Jesus on this narrow path, we will be successful because Christ has made us his own. And if you're a Christian, you already belong to the kingdom of God. That is where you currently live now and forever. And in that kingdom, the will of God is done in your heart and in your mind. And you will do God's will by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit through the rest of this life continuously and into eternity forever after. The good fruit of righteousness which the Spirit is producing in you will be 
continuous. So press on. So there's four ways to test the fruit of people who claim to be Christ followers. And you should, because Jesus says, beware. Jesus says we can expect his people to bear good fruit. The fruit will be obvious. It'll be consistent in those who live in his kingdom. It'll be copious and plentiful. You'll find lots of proof that they love Jesus And that fruit will be with us until the end. Now let me close with just one thought before we take communion. The best way to apply this teaching is not to put other people under a microscope. It is obviously appropriate to do that at some times. Jesus warns us. But I think his warning, beware of false prophets, could also rightly be stated like this. Beware that you yourself are not a false prophet. Beware that you yourself do not claim that you belong to God while you evidence no fruit of His Spirit. Take the log out of your own eye. Inspect your own fruit. Are you a healthy tree? Does your heart bear the good fruit of Jesus? Is the Holy Spirit producing the good deeds of Christ in your life? Is your goodness obvious to those around you? Is your goodness consistent? Or would some people be surprised to find out that you go to church? Is the fruit of righteousness copious in your life? Is there an abundance of good fruit flowing from your soul as you do the will of God? I pray that the Lord will give you eyes to take an honest assessment and the grace to produce more good fruit. And it's all about Jesus here, isn't it? We're going to take communion. And the reason we take communion is is to celebrate the good fruit of our Lord and Master, our teacher, the one we follow. Jesus himself produced the works of righteousness, good fruit, when he obeyed the will of God the Father and died for our redemption, giving his life for our salvation. His good fruit was conspicuous, wasn't it? It was obvious, which is why they had to have liars at his trial to make stuff up. And it was consistent. Whether he was meeting with Nicodemus in the night or whether he was teaching in the temple by day, it was copious. Everywhere he went, he taught about the kingdom of God. He taught people to walk in the will of God. He healed the sick. He loved those who were on the margins. And it was continuous. Never did he falter in doing the good work of God. Which is why we can expect it in those who bear his name. As we follow him where he leads. We feast on his body and his blood with joyful hearts. Because our God overcame evil with good. And he established for himself a people for his glory who likewise would do the good works of God because they are filled with that same Spirit.